And thanks again for joining us for today's MSDN webcast, Visual C Sharp 2010 Soup to Nuts. Today's session is Part 5, Language Fundamentals. Now without any further delay, I'm going to turn the floor over to today's presenter, William Steele. Thank you, Tracy, and uh, welcome to uh, this fifth part of this uh, C Sharp Soup to Nuts webcast series. Um, today we are going to be talking about some of the basic fundamental uh, features of a C Sharp program. And uh, um, to, to start off with, we're going to uh, uh, learn a little bit more about types. We talked about those a couple weeks ago and, and what a type was. And uh, we're going to then relate that to how we actually use a type within our application. And we can use it in various different ways. Um, but uh, generally when we refer to a type, we're going to assign it to some kind of a variable. Um, so we'll talk about what a variable is, and we'll compare and contrast a variable with another similar type of object called a constant. Um, and we'll see how we can utilize both of those within our applications. Um, and then we'll take it a little step further by by uh, starting to describe the uh, the basic features of the C-sharp language, um, specifically through statements and expressions. A statement is a command that you might issue to your application or to the uh, the framework to have... Uh, have it perform some action for you. And a part of a statement um, optionally can be what we call an expression. Um, and that's something that can be evaluated uh, by the statement uh, to determine whether it should take an action or not um, or to uh, to make a decision, if you will. Uh, so we'll see how all of these relate together um, by the end of this webcast. So starting off with types, a type, as we remember, is just an object. So uh, remember, an object, anything within the .NET framework is based off of this object called system.object. So that's a, a base class fundamental feature of the .NET framework. And everything, literally everything that we do with inside of C Sharp deals with the system.object. System.object is a type. Uh, a type is a generic way of referring to any object within the system. And a type specifically refers to the uh, unique versions of an object. So when we say type, uh, a type can be an integer, it can be a string, um, and those are all objects, uh, but they are specific versions of that object um, with specific properties unique to themselves. Now, there are two basic types of types within C Sharp. Uh, there are uh, value types and there are reference types. A value type is the simplest of all in that it is simply represented by the value of information that it's, that it's storing. So, for example, when we talk about a number, an integer, uh, a floating point number, or a decimal, or something like that, we are referring to the value of that within our code. Um, so a value type refers to, when we pass the object around, uh, the fact that we are passing the value of that object around as opposed to passing an in a copy of that object um, or a reference to that object. Now, a reference on the other type, on the other side, is um, a, a much more complex object, um, so complex that it actually requires memory to be allocated um, and that memory is, you know, allocated out of the large pool of memory that's available to all of your applications. Um, and a pointer uh, is created, some kind of an object that refers to that, like an alias, um, refers to that spot in memory that we will call your variable. Uh, that reference is something that we would then use to pass around to refer to that spot in memory. So we have value types where... The object is very simple, and it can be simply stored on the stack, uh, which is the uh, 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 chain in memory, if you will, that it's a small spot in memory where uh, very quick uh, calculations can be performed. It's a you know very small amount of memory that holds uh, instantly created and instantly destroyed style objects. Um, and then we have the heap, which is the rest of your global memory. So um, on in the heap, we would create these reference type objects where we would refer to a spot in memory, whereas a value type is actually just stored right on the stack and it's used instantaneously. So we have two different types of objects, but interestingly enough, internally to our code, we generally will use them interchangeably. Um, so what that means is uh, we can use a value type or a reference type in any way that we want to. As a matter of fact, we can even treat one as the other. So there are special commands within C Sharp that allow us to say, this is a value type, but I'd like you to treat it as a reference type and vice versa. Um, so uh, there are, um, 
there are uh, uh, other, uh, you know, there, there are ways to use these objects, um, you know, even beyond what we are, um, uh, what we're going to be describing today. Now, whenever you create a type, uh, there is a scenario where you want to be able to use that type as a, um, a spot in memory on a regular basis. And if you're going to be using it more than one time, generally what you want to do is to create an alias to it so that you can use that alias over and over. Um, and that alias is what we call a variable. A variable is simply a... Uh, a, an object that represents you pointing to a spot in memory that stores your data, and are generally, um, they represent an actual instance of a particular type that you've defined. So we have, whether it's an int, uh, a, a value type or a reference type, we have this object that we say, okay, this is an, a foo object. Well, let's, let's make it a real world example, a person object. So here we have a person object. Now, a person object simply defines the characteristics of what a person does, and it contains any of the functionality associated with that person. When I create an instance of it, I'm, I'm actually creating a real set of data associated with that object. Um, so in order to do that, let's say I create a Bill Steele object. I now have a, a spot in memory that actually stores all of the values that I've associated with that Bill Steele object. And that spot in memory is given an alias that we call a variable. So um, the spot in memory is actually the instance of our type, and the name of that spot in memory, that address, if you will, happens to be our variable name. So we can give it any friendly name that we want to, and we can then later on refer to that friendly name in the rest of our code. Now, just like I talked about the value types and reference types can be complex and simple, uh, a variable can be, you know, it's basically a, you define a variable by telling it what type of object it is using. So whether that be a number or a text or, you know, any other type of object that you want to do. Uh, you would simply say, I need a new, uh, one of these types of objects. So if I had a person, I would create a new person. Um, and then what I can do is then use the assignment operator, which is the equal statement in C-sharp, to assign a value to that uh, particular variable. So let's go ahead and see this in code here. And uh, in our code, um, uh, when I go to the next screen, it's going to take me out to what we call our view sharing demo, where you're going to be able to see my desktop. Now, uh, in my computer screen is set to 1024 by 768. So if your screen is set to that or higher resolution, you can actually hit the F5 key to maximize your entire display, um, and you'll be able to see my entire display. And when we're done with the view sharing demo, you can hit the F5 key again, uh, and that will return you back to the normal dashboard. F please feel free to ask me any questions in the Q&A panel. Um, I can see the Q&A panel up, and when I come back from each one of these demos, I'll go ahead and verbally answer any of the questions that were in the queue there. Okay, so so here we are out at our C-sharp uh, uh, C 2010 Express, and I'm just going to create a new project. And we're going to do something really simple. We're just going to create a simple Windows Form application. And in our Windows Form application, we're going to go ahead and just put a couple little things on there so we can play around with it. We're going to put a label on the, on the display, and we're going to put a button on the display. Now, um, all of our code is going to be stuck inside of this button. So we'll just double-click on that to bring up the event handler for that button. Now, we are going to create a variable. A variable is simply a spot in memory that holds a value that we've assigned to something. Um, and I'm going to define a very simple one real quick. Let's just define a very simple number. An, an int is a number. An integer, um, as you can see, is a system uh, dot int32 type of object. So it's a 32-bit integer. And we're just going to call it uh, my number. And we're going to assign it a value, 7718. Now, so what I've done is I've created a spot in memory that holds some integer value. And then I've assigned that spot in memory the value 7718. So now in any future part of my application where this is a, va a valid object, um, I can actually refer to this value in memory simply by referring to its name. Now, in this example, you know, this uh, my number is a lot longer than the value itself, so it might be easier to, to use that over and over. Um, however, when we go to compile this, if we're using it 57 times, we're only going to have one spot in memory allocated to this value. If we typed in the value 57 times, we would wind up with 57 different copies of this, and each one of them would be unique from any of the others. 
Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, and I'm going to, uh, when I click this button, I'm going to take that value and assign it to this uh, label. Um, and I accidentally double-clicked on the label, so we can ignore this code down below here. But what we're going to do is we're going to take that value that I've put in here, and we're going to put it in that label. So this label text is going to be equal to my number to string. Now what this is doing is it's taking this variable called my number and it's converting it into a string so that it can uh, store it in that uh, label's text property. So when I run this application, I can click on the button and I've loaded up that value into this text string. Um, now you'll notice that this object has this two string method. Remember, all objects, even simple integers, are derived from system.object and one of the five primary methods that are on every object is the ability to convert that object to a string. Um, so we're using that very simple base class function con uh, to convert to a string. If I did not have this, because this variable is not a string um, and this text property is expecting a string, uh, you see that the compiler gives us a little uh, red squiggly line indicating, hey, you haven't explicitly converted this to a string and C-sharp is very, very particular. Um, uh, in this case, you need to convert this to a string. Um, so it's saying, I, I do not accept numbers, I only accept strings. So in order to do that, we simply call the toString method. Every object within the .NET framework, by the way, has an implementation of toString. The default implementation of toString, if you haven't assigned any um, implementation, is to simply return the type of object that it is. So if I did not assign this, it might say, you know, it was an int or an integer of 32. So that's a very simple um, object. I can create more complex objects. For example, I can I can create a class. Um, we'll call it person. And in this class, we can create you know a few properties. So property, um, uh, we'll call it name. Um, actually, string name. So in this case, I've just created a, a, a an object called a person. Now, if I wanted to utilize this person, I can actually create a new instance of it by saying person, and we'll call it Bill, equals a new person. Now, this is an interesting uh, variation. Remember on our simple types, our value types, um, we create them on the stack. So we don't have to declare any memory. We don't have to allocate anything. Whenever we create one, it just puts it on the stack for us, and we can start using it immediately. But when we create an object in the heap, um, and we're basing it off of some definition of an object prior to that, in this case, this person object that I just defined, um, we need to actually tell the system, I would like you to create a new instance of this for me using that new keyword. And what this new keyword actually does is it goes out and it tells the .NET framework, hey, allocate a spot in memory large enough to hold this person object and give it the alias Bill. So I've created this a variable now called bill. And once I've created it, I can now start using it. For example, I can start setting up properties on it. Now, we have a property called name on this one that I created, and we can start assigning it values. So you notice in this case, I'm actually going to uh, assign uh, this object twice. The first one is I'm assigning it a new instance of this. This is where I'm creating the alias, and I'm assigning it uh, I'm basically telling it from now on when I refer to Bill, I want you to refer to this spot refer to this spot in memory that's defined by this person object. And then in addition to that, I'm going to drill down into that spot in memory and look for the particular subspot in memory where we've defined the variable called name. And that's this public property down here uh, that is a string called name. Um, now you don't have to worry about the set and the get features yet. Don't worry about any of this stuff just yet. Uh, we'll we'll start talking about that later on. Um, in this case, uh, technically, I can actually get rid of all of this and just do that and define it as a public string name, um, and I get the exact same value. But the compiler is nice, and it thinks that we're doing a few other things for us. But now that I've assigned the name, I can then start using that. So instead of putting in my number to string, I can simply say bill.name. And what this is going to do is it's going to take that variable that I have called bill, um, and it's going to look at the subvariable within that called name, um, and it's going to use that value to display in our text box and our label there. So when I click it, I get my full name there. So these are two examples of a value type and a reference type object. Remember, a value type is very simple, and it doesn't need to have 
any construction done to it. We can simply start assigning values to it. Whereas a reference type needs to have a construction uh, mechanism, and then once only then uh, can we then start assigning properties to it. Um, so that hopefully tells you know gives you a good idea of the difference between the two. One is a more complex object. One is a very simple object. Okay, back over to our our uh, code. Um, or I mean our slide deck. Now let's talk about another type of thing that often gets confused with variables, and that's something called a constant. A constant is is kind of like a variable. They look like it, and you can use them like it in code up to a point. A constant, though, is exactly that. It is constant. It doesn't change its value. So in, in, instead of it having to be, you know, allocated for in memory, because it is constant, we can actually define it in the compiler, and the compiler can stick the appropriate value in whenever it needs to use it. I mean, this actually saves, you know, makes our applications a little bit more performant over using a variable to do that, because it doesn't have to wrap any logic around checking its values and all this other magic stuff. It just simply is inserted in line with the code, and that value is then used from that point forward. Do you define them very similar to the way you define a variable, except you use the keyword constant. And that lets the compiler know, hey, this value from this point forward is not going to change. Some examples of that constant are the value pi, 3.14159265535, whatever. Um, we could go on and on with that. Um, that value doesn't change. And there is no concept of reassigning that value. So you wouldn't, you know, say pi equals pi plus one. Um, that, that doesn't make sense. The speed of light is a constant and you can't change that. That's another example. Um, so, uh, there's, those, uh, concepts, you know, when it comes to a constant, don't exist. So there's no reason to have any, uh, writable features. It's a read-only type of object. Um, and when we do the compilation, when we compile the application, uh, it actually replaces the values in memory uh, with the value that it actually represents. So it's an alias to a fixed value, if, in other words. So let's go ahead and see what they look like in our code. Um, again, back over to our sharing demo. And in this case, I have uh, my number here called 7718. Now, I can define a constant anywhere I want to. I'm going to go ahead and put it out here um, just to define it. You know, you can define them... Uh, because it's constant, the compiler can recognize it pretty much anywhere. Uh, but we can do a constant. Uh, we'll just call this um, int um, my constant equals 1024. So what I've done is I've defined a value called my constant that is equal to 1024. Now, it looks just like a, a, the declaration of the variable, except it has this keyword constant in the front of it. And this keyword constant is basically saying it's not a variable, but I'm going to use it like one. So remember earlier when I assigned the value to this, I could say, you know, uh, my constant. Uh, but you'll notice one other little change here. It is a, uh, a value that doesn't change. Uh, and because it doesn't change, it's not an object. It doesn't have all of those features that an object does. Now, uh, again, this is not an object, so it's not derived from system that object. It's only done dealt with via the compiler. So what I can do instead is I can assign it to a variable if I want, um, and I can simply say my constant here, C-O-N-S-T, um, and now the value my number gets assigned this fixed value, and I can use that here. So my number, uh, my number, dot two string. So in this case, I've assigned uh, my number equal to this constant, and when I run it and click the button, I get my 1024 value. Interestingly enough, though, I can't take the constant uh, and add anything to it. I can't assign it, so I can't make it equal to 500, for example. It'll actually complain about that and say, hey, the constant cannot be changed. It is a fixed value, and it will always be the value 1024. If you want to change it, you can only change it at the time you're writing your code. So if I wanted to change it there, I could. Um, however, beyond that, I can't do anything with it. But I can do uh, other things to that. So I can use that, for example, as a part of my expression um, to uh, assign this number. So in this case, 7718 plus my constant value uh, would be the result down here. So you can see we can use it very similar to a variable. Um, however, it's not an object like you would think it would be. It's just a, it's just a fixed value. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's no different uh, when we compile this to saying, you know, we have 7718, which technically is a constant. Um, we can also replace that with this, and that's exactly the same thing. 
Um, interestingly enough, this uh, expression here, uh, 7718 plus 500, actually gets compiled out as well. It doesn't actually do the math at runtime. Instead, it replaces both of these with the calculated result, um, which is a, uh, just a little trivia bit there. Okay, so I have that uh, constant. We can see that the constant's very similar to that. Um, we can create variables and constants uh, from other types of objects as well. So, um, so for example, a string, uh, we can say my uh, name equals William William J. Steele. So uh, I now have a constant called my name, and I can simply replace that and place this in here. Uh, it is a string. Oops. So in this case, I'm replacing this label with the constant value from my name. Again, if I run this, um, I now have the William J. Steele plugged in there. And that would be just the same thing as me assigning uh, label one text equal to William J. Steele. Um, and then same thing with a variable here. I can create a variable that's based off of a string, uh, something like that. And then I can assign uh, that same value there. So I could assign the string variable s equal to this string type, um, and then this string type uh, would then uh, could then be used, you know, for anywhere else. As a matter of fact, interestingly enough, the string type even contains the two-string method, which really doesn't make sense because the string is a string, so you don't have to convert it to it. Um, but uh, it, because everything is based off of that system.object, um, it, will, it will always have that two-string method. Okay, so let me save this and go back over to our slide deck. And let's talk about the most important aspect of a C-sharp program, and that's what we call a statement. A statement is a command that you're going to explicitly give to C-sharp to have it do something for you. Um, now, what you know, a a any computer language is built up of basic commands, um, and those commands are what we call statements in C-sharp. Each one of them can is a, you know represents a small building block of the entire application. Now in C sharp, a statement is usually going to end with a semicolon. However, there are ways of you know uh, some statements if they're multi-line might not actually have a semicolon. They might actually instead be contained within what we call a code block, which would be the open curly brace all the way down to a co closed curly brace. When we see that type of scenario with a curly brace is open and closed. Basically, what that means is that our application or our statement can contain multiple substatements within that. So we can have um, nested statements in that case. Now, there are basically a few different types of statements. There are statements that can be used to um, declare an object. Uh, you saw the constant statement. You saw the, uh, the statement where I created a new instance of a variable, for example. There are statements that allow us to assign a value or, or perform some operation on an object. Um, so, for example, when I set the value of that integer equal to 7718, I assigned it using the equals operator. That is a statement of itself. Um, there are other types of objects out there or other types of uh, um, statements out there that can be performed on different types of commands. But pretty much everything that you do inside of C Sharp is going to be done via some kind of a statement. Now, sometimes those statements don't necessarily happen to have any text associated with them. Um, and that's really an interesting thing. You know, when I assign a value, for example, there is no statement that says, hey, assign this value. Instead, we just take that variable and we make it equal to whatever that value is. And that's what we call an implicit statement. We've implicitly asked the system to do that for us. Other types of statements actually allow us to execute additional code. For example, when I created that class with a person on it, um, there is an implicit new statement that we called um, that creates a new instance of that object. In addition to that, we had that property on there called name. And that name, if you remember, I removed the get and the set um, portions of that. That's where we allow, we can actually write code that allows us to assign and re return the value from those. And those are actually done via methods. A method is a call on another object. Um, get and set are actually methods. So let's go ahead and take a look at a few statements within C Sharp and see how we can uh, utilize those to, to start building more and more advanced advanced applications. So back over to my sharing demo here. Um, we already can see that there are actually a few statements that we've already done. Now, interestingly enough, we haven't really pointed them out yet, but pretty much anything that starts a line with blue is a statement. So here we have different types of statements. Here's a namespace statement. 
Here's that constant statement. Now, public is kind of an identifier for uh, a hidden statement that's kind of missing, and that, in this case, the, that statement is called new. But we can see an instance of that down here, where we have this new method or this new uh, new statement being called here. So, interestingly enough, this assignment of this new object, the statement that we're calling, the whole line is a statement. But in addition to that, this new is a statement. Um, so, again, uh, remember we talked about the semicolons at the end. Notice how each one of these statements has uh, has a, a trailing semicolon indicating the end of this statement has occurred. Now, uh, the other one to point out, though, is this, this uh, whole uh, method block here. When we look at this function, we can see that uh, it doesn't have a semicolon at the end of it. Instead, it has the open brace and cur uh, closed curly brace, and those indicate that this statement begins here and it ends here, and then all of these within this are additional statements, you know, sub-statements to that one. Um, and we see that throughout the, the way C Sharp is organized. So pretty much every object that you would have will either have an open or closed curly brace, or will be preceded uh, by a sem or a, a, a ended by a semicolon. So uh, those let you indicate you know types of statements. Notice here though, in this particular case, um, this statement here we have the integer assignment of my number. We've created the my number, and then we've assigned it. This is a multiple statement line. Um, in fact, if I wanted to, I could break this down into its subcomponents. So I could say, I'm just going to create a new one called i. So int i, and then i equals 7718, and then i equals, you know, i plus uh, my constant. Um, in the end, i would equal the same value as my number. Um, but we've done it on, you know, multiple statements. So I've assigned the initial value, and then I added the constant value to that. Um, also notice that in this case, because we're using a variable, I have the ability to refer to itself in its assignment. So here I have a variable i. I'm assigning the variable i, but I'm also using that variable i as a portion of the expression that I use to reassign itself. So if i was 1 in this case, and our my constant up here is 500, we would get... Um, i is equal to zero here. Uh, when we assign it, i becomes one. When we reassign it, this one gets, uh, this basically, because it equals one, this, this statement evaluates to one right here. So one plus 500 equals 501. So when we get to this point in our code, um, and we start utilizing this variable, we can see that i is going to be equal to 501. As a matter of fact, I can even do an i dot to string, and we can run this, and we'll see that we'll get the value 501. Um, and each one of these is an independent statement by itself because they are ended by a semicolon. Um, and in this case, we have a whole bunch of statements combined together into one larger statement uh, that represents, you know, um, basically all of these together. Back over to our code. And uh, we're going to actually wrap it up with this portion where we talk about expressions. We're going to take a look at those statements a little bit further and if you look at those, you know, an example of that third i assignment was i equals i plus 1. Interestingly enough, i plus 1 turns out to be something else that we call an expression. An expression is something that needs to be evaluated by the system uh, in order to determine uh, what the result is or what the result should do. A lot of statements will have optional expressions that you need to pass in uh, or that you can pass in to help that statement do the work that it's designed to do. A great example of this is statements that evaluate business logic. Um, and the most basic form of business logic is what we call the if statement. If a condition is met, then do this. And that is the most basic fundamental aspect of a uh, uh, of any programming language, and, th and that's this, this concept of a compare where I can compare one value to another. And it turns out microprocessors are absolutely fantastic at doing these compares. Uh, as a matter of fact, they have instructions built right into the CPU that know how to do some of these basic things, like compare one value to another. Uh, compare a value to see if it's larger, to see if it's less, to see if it's equal, um, as well as some of the other basic things that we would do in an expression, things like adding, you know, 1 plus 1 or 1 minus 1. Some more complex processors even have statements that are built in around expressions to help them do uh, more complex math, like multiplying and dividing. 
those all um, can be broken down into what we call an expression. And an expression is basically um, a series of statements and commands that represent a single value. And that single value can be either can be something as simple as a Boolean value, a true or false, or it can be something really complex like the result of a mathematical calculation. You know, the sine of a value of, you know, the sine of the angle 30, you know, is what, right? Um, and that result, that is an, ex the result of that is the result of the expression calculator. Now, we always use expressions in conjunction with um, business logic because the business logic actually needs to have an understanding of how it should make a decision and how the results should be um, presented. When we do a, a, a statement that is doing business logic like that, we will pick out the type of expression that best fits um, what our needs are. And the way we do that um, is within Visual Studio, the IntelliSense engine in Visual Studio will let us know the variable types, the types of data that it can accept, as well as the types of expressions and what the results of this expression should look like. So, for example, the if statement, the if statement is very simple. It's simply looking for whether a condition is true or false. If it is true, then take this action, if it, or if it is false, then, you know, don't take it. And um, that expression, whatever we pass in there, um, must result in a true or false statement. Now, we can take very simple expressions and we can combine them together to make much more advanced expressions. So I could say, you know, if an expression is true, do this. But I can also say if an ex expression A is true or if expression B is true, then do this. And that or becomes a secondary, you know, another level of, of uh, expression. So we then have basically three expressions being evaluated is, you know, uh, we evaluate uh, expression A to see if it's true or false. We evaluate expression B to see if it's true or false. And then we evaluate the results of those two together, you know, is A or B's result or, you know, uh, if is expression A's result or expression B's result true. Um, and if, if either one of those is the case, then the whole uh, uh, expression evaluator will return true. Um, so that's a much more advanced uh, scenario. However, um, it's something that we will do quite often inside of our C-sharp programs. Now, as I said before, expressions are contained in statements. They're always a part of a statement. Generally, you will not have a um, an expression standing on its own because there there has to be some action wrapped around that expression. And the way the expression evaluator works in C-sharp is very similar to the way you would generally do it. There's an order of precedence defined around which commands which uh, work in which order. If you think about math, then the, the, uh, the deeper you nest something in parentheses in your math expressions, um, they're the first ones to get processed. And that's just the way the .NET framework is going to process it as well. It also has order of precedence when it comes to the type of expression um, operation that you're doing, um, adding and subtracting, for example, multiplying and dividing, um, those have an order of precedence that's very similar to the way you would do it in math. So multiplications occur first, for example. Um, and then, um, you know, we can, we can build that all the way out into our final value. Now, when we do a simple expression, 5 plus 2, as our slide has here, um, that's two very simple type values. An expression is always going to break down into, at some point, the result is going to be a very simple type value. Um, and um, we might start off with some very complex objects, but eventually it's, it'll, we evaluate down into something that's very simple. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at a few different examples of uh, some expressions and see how they can be associated with um, our code in, in, uh, um, uh, as it comes to doing statements here. So right away, we can see, now that you know what an expression is, you can see that I have an expression right here. And in this case, I have uh, an assignment operator statement that is taking an expression in it um, and then doing and storing the results of that expression uh, into a variable. So we could say, you know, this is I and this is I, but it could just as easily be A and B uh, being two different objects. And that, that makes no difference to the system. The expression evaluator will, will then look at these values, though, and it'll look at i, and it'll say, okay, i is 1, so it's the same thing as replacing that with a 1, and my constant is 500, so it's the same thing as replacing that with a 500, um, and then it'll evaluate this together and come up with 501, and then it'll store that result in this variable called i. 
So you can see how simple that expression evaluator uh, is in that case. Um, we can do much more complex things, though. So in this case, I have a value of i, um, and, and this, uh, we have this button 1. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move this variable i outside of here. I'm going to move it to the def I'm going to define it outside of this button. That way it's available to us over a longer duration of, of, of time. Um, and this is, this is, uh, by moving it outside of here, we've, we've basically created the object at this class level as opposed to within this button level. That way it doesn't fall out of scope. So we're creating the value 1 here, um, and I'm going to remove that uh, assignment of, of 1 initially, um, and we're just going to allow this to, to live on here. So what's going to happen is i is going to be assigned some value initially. When you first define variable i, it's assigned a value of 0. So this and this are equivalent. So in i or in i equals 0. When we have a simple type, a simple type is always assigned the, the most basic zero value, if you will. So if it's a number, it's assigned the value of zero. If it's a string, it's assigned the value of an empty string. Um, so in this case, I have i is equal to zero, um, and that's just a, a given default. And then what I'm doing in my code is every time I click the button, I'm adding the value of i to whatever my constant value is. And if you remember, our constant value is defined as 500 up here. So we have our constant value 500. Um, so my expression is i equals i plus, I mean, uh, the expression itself is i plus 500. So every time this button is clicked, it's going to take 500, and it's going to add it to the value of i. We're then going to assign that value back to the original spot in memory, um, in this case on the stack where our, our variable is created. So in this case, we're going to, uh, uh, at the first pass, 0 is going to be the value for i, and uh, 500 is the value for our constant. So 500 plus 0 is 500. We're going to store that in here. And then down here, we'll print the value 500. So if I run this, I'm going to print 500. And when I click it again, I'll get 1,000. And I click it again, I get 1,500. Um, and the reason that's not 0 is because we've we've assigned that outside of this. Um, but then inside here, we don't ever change that over the value um, back to its original 0. So this was only when it was declared was the value 0. Any time after that, it's no longer 0. Okay, so now in this case, we have a very simple expression that, that, that's basically adding two values together. But we can then utilize that within our code um, to do some more complex things. So for example, we can take an if statement. And if we look at the definition of an if statement, an if statement actually takes an expression. Um, by the way, I do want to point out in, in C Sharp, um, as well as in most of the other languages in, in uh, the .NET framework, uh, we have the ability to um, uh, ask the system for help on our code. So if I don't know a particular command or if I'm interested in learning more about a command, I can simply double-click on that command and hit F1, and that will bring up the help system for that particular object or command or statement, whatever it happens to be. Um, so as we scroll down through here, uh, we can see, for example, a... Um, I, I, I clicked on the keyword this, so we, we looked at that, um, and we can see the keyword example for this. And it talks about all the different usages of that object. Now, as I scroll down through here, you know, there are other types of commands that I can use. As a matter of fact, I can even, I can either do a search online in the MSDN reference, or I can go back into my code and just start typing in the code. Um, so, for example, if um, i is greater than 500, This happens to be an expression. So in our case, uh, our first value is 500, uh, first value of 0. So when we store this on the first button click, we get a value of 500. 500 is not going to be greater than uh, the value of 500. In fact, 500 is equal to it. Um, so in that case, it will not display any new text value. But the second time around that I click it, the value is going to be 500 plus 500 equals 1,000. 1,000 is greater than 500, so we will get um, that command. And here you can see when I click on the F1 in the if statement, um, we actually get an example of if some result, um, in this case the result has to evaluate to expression an expression that's true, um, then do something. Notice that there is an else condition uh, for this if statement. Otherwise, do something else. Now remember that this result happens to be the expression that we're talking about. So we're passing in an expression into a statement um, and letting it do the work for us. So now when I run this, when I click on the button the first time, 
nothing happens to our label. But when I click it the second time, I now get a value of a thousand because I told it to basically skip the first 500 printing. So very, very simple logic. We have a statement, we have an expression, and we have a statement again that's nested. In this case, we have the curly brackets. Now I only have one line in here, um, and this is an interesting uh, little scenario in C sharp. If I only have one line of code in the curly braces, I can actually eliminate the curly braces. This is something that a lot of people don't like to do. Some people do it. It's perfectly acceptable to do that. Um, it's still indented underneath of it. If I is greater than 500, then do this one single line. Uh, if I had another line under here, you'll notice that the, the cursor starts um, back over underneath the if statement. So it, it lines up correctly where it should be. Um, but if I wanted to do multiple actions or multiple statements in this if block, then I would definitely need to include those in curly braces. Um, I have a preference to keep the curly braces there just so that you know that, hey, this is the entire if statement that we're talking about. Now, in this case, we have this very simple Boolean operator, if I is less than 500. Um, but I can also add on to that. Um, there are other types of operators that we can do. I can say if I is greater than equal to 500 um, or if it's less than 500, whatever it happens to be. Um, as long as it's less than, you know, maybe 1,500 uh, printed out. But you can also use other types of operators in here. Now, in our if statement, when we talk about an expression, we can actually use our help again, go back over to this, and, and actually look up expressions um, and, and figure out, you know, more complex versions of our if statement. So here is uh, a, a conditional statement where we have multiple conditions. Um, let's see if there's other examples that get more detailed. Um, C sharp keyword operators. So here's a here's a shortened version, and this is an interesting version of the expressions um, where x is not equal to 0, 0.0, which is an interesting version of an expression. Um, this is a, um, a a much shorter version, but it's much harder to read when you look at this. Um, this statement here says if x is not equal to zero, then do this; otherwise, return the result of one. Um, so this is a, 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 a it's a, one that a lot of people, you know, very few people use. Um, it does make it handy. It does it on one single line, um, but it's, you know, much more complex. And it turns out that this entire thing is the expression for this return statement. Um, so this uh, is what we call an immediate if statement. So it's immediately checking a condition if x is equal to zero or not equal to zero. Um, question mark means do this if it's true. Otherwise, do this if it's if this if it's false. So the colon separates the true side of it from the false side of it. Um, so that's an example of, of a little bit more complex version of it. But just remember that you know anything that you see within parentheses is generally going to be an expression, um, and an expression could be a parameter to a method. It can be um, it can be a um, uh, uh, a parameter to a method, it could be the, you know, the the logic to a conditional statement. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that we can actually utilize expressions for. So I'm popping back over to my slide deck. Let me try that again. Okay, I just got a lost connection. <laughs> so, if you, um, Tracy, can you pop me back over to the session summary? Absolutely, we're there now. Okay. Um, so that actually covers up our session. I'm not real sure when I lost the connection, how long ago I did, but I just see my network has gone down here. Um, so um, the we talked about types today. We talked about uh, variables and constants and, and how a, uh, a type, any type of object that we utilize in C Sharp can be stored inside of a variable, and we can build a static version of it called a constant, one that doesn't change that we can utilize later on in our code, um, store that in a constant value. Remember, constants are not taking up any memory. They actually get compiled out of your code, where a variable actually is allocated, whether that's a simple type or a complex type, either on the stack or in the heap of memory that's globally, globally allocated to your application. Uh, and then we looked at statements and expressions. A statement is any kind of command that you would give it, uh, give C Sharp, you know, um, asking it to do something for you. I want, you know, for example, I want to print something out. Uh, Console.writeline is, is an example of a statement. Um, and the parameters that we pass to it are going to be our expressions. So a console.writeline hello world, the expression in, our, in that case is hello world, uh, where we would actually um, uh, you know, have the value um, 
It could be calculated. It could be static. It doesn't make any difference what it is, but the expression is the, the portion that gets evaluated by the statement. Um, I, <laughs> off the top of my head, I can't see my machine because my, my computer's all um, hosed up right now, but the next slide should be the uh, next week's slide, what we're talking about next week. And uh, oh, we did statements this week, so we should be doing some very uh, complex stuff next week or more complex stuff. Uh, specifically around prob- uh, branching and looping, is it? <laughs> I'm pretty sure it is. Yep. So, uh, so branching and looping is a, a very special type of conditional statement uh, where we we start off with a, the most basic type of business logic is this uh, logic where a computer makes a, a decision one way or another. If a condition is true, you know, if this expression evaluates to true, then take this action. We saw some examples of that just now. Um, later on. Uh, we can make that more complex by saying, okay, if an expression evaluates to something, then do this until some another condition occurs. Or um, maybe you have a you know set of text that you want to print out five times. I want to do this uh, condition five times. So you have an expression that evaluates to you know um, true only when it's within one through five. The values are one through five. We can then utilize that type of logic to create what we call looping. Looping is where an, a bit of code executes multiple numbers of times based on some set of criteria, uh, you know, as a result of some evaluation of an expression. Um, so we have uh, various types of loops. There's while loops. There's for loops. Um, and those are just more complex versions of these branching type instructions that we, uh, that the basis of a computer is this compare uh, that we generally refer to as an if-then statement. So that's what we're going to talk about next week. Um, I do want to thank everybody for uh, um, uh, stopping in today and watching this session. Um, my uh, contact information is on one of the slides here, um, wsteel at microsoft.com. Feel free to send me a uh, uh, email. I'll answer any questions that you have. Also, feel free to follow me on Twitter at uh, wjsteel. That's at wjsteel on Twitter, um, and uh, where we talk about, you know, what I'm working on, uh, what's upcoming, you know, in the webcast series. We've got a bunch of cool new webcast series coming out after this. Um, for example, I'm, I'm working on one right now called Azure Soup to Nuts, if you're interested at all in the Microsoft Azure's cloud computing initiative. Um, and uh, the next up is our survey slide. I do want to uh, express, uh, have you please, please, please fill out that survey. Let us know how we're doing. Let me know how I'm doing. Let us know what you want to see in upcoming episodes, you know, webcasts. Um, and, um, you know, I look forward to, I, I read every one of these that, you know, uh, that I can, um, the results, I should say. You guys put feedback in there. Let me know what I'm doing good, what I need to work on, whatnot. And, uh, uh, Tracy, you want to go ahead and get them into the survey? You bet. So what everybody should be seeing now is the survey up on the page. What you want to do is uh, follow the links provided to complete the evaluation. And like William said, we really do appreciate the feedback that you leave there and for us, so please do fill it out before you log off. Also, I want to remind folks that the PDF for today's presentation is available. If you go to the printer icon in the bottom right-hand side of your live meeting screen, uh, you can either print the slides or save them locally for your convenience. And uh, Bill, we actually we don't have any questions waiting in the queue, so we can go ahead and uh, wrap things up for the moment. Okay, well, next week is uh, branching and looping, so that's actually going to be a really good one. We'll start getting some really, really functional applications. Until then, you guys have a nice week. Great. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude today's session. Thanks again for joining us. You may now disconnect from the audio portion of today's presentation.